Hi there, and welcome to my video on real zeros of a polynomial. Now, this in this video, we're going to go through a lot of different uh, theorems and see a lot of different things we can use to help us find real zeros. We'll actually talk a little bit more about the, the, the process I want you to use uh, in class ne at next time. So, our skill objectives, number one, apply the remainder theorem. Number two, apply the factor theorem. Number three, use Descartes' rule of signs. Number four, utilize the upper and lower bound theorems to narrow a search. Number five, find the real zeros of a polynomial. Number six, factor the polynomial. And number seven, use the intermediate value theorem to approximate zeros when that is something that we, when it's necessary. Let's start out with the remainder theorem. And what we have here is if a polynomial p of x is divided by x minus a and has a remainder r, then p of a is equal to r. In other words, that if I, if I go through, like in this case right here, I have an example. I'm going to take p of x, which equals x cubed minus 2x squared minus 5x plus 3, and I'm going to divide it by x minus 2. So what I'm going to do is set it up with synthetic division. And what I'm, what's going to happen here is whatever ends up in, as a remainder, that actually will end up being the result I would get if I put 2 in for all the x's. So right now, I want you to pause the video, and I'd like you to find p of 2. Just plug 2 in for all the x's in the polynomial and see what you get. Then we'll come back and we'll do the uh, uh, synthetic division. Okay, welcome back. When you plug 2 in 4x, you should have come up with a negative 7. So let's go through and run through with synthetic division here. So I've set this up. I have a 2. I put the 2 because it's x minus 2, so I put the 2 there. And my coefficients in descending order is at 1x on the x cubed, negative 2 on the x squared, negative 5 on the x, and a constant of 3. And so running through with synthetic division, I know the first coefficient just comes down. 2 times 1 is going to be 2. I add it up. I get 0. 2 times 0 is 0. Add it up. I get negative 5. And 2 times negative 5 is negative 10. And sure enough, I get negative 7. And so what we have is that this value here is the same value we got over here. That is not a coincidence, and that will always happen. So the other thing that what this is, is this also gives us another name for synthetic division. I've also heard of synthetic division, also called synthetic substitution, for this reason. It gives you a fast way to go and evaluate a function without necessarily having to plug it in and identify each individual power of, that, of whatever A happened to be. Now we'll get to the factor theorem. And what the factor theorem says is if, if p of a or p of a equals 0, if and only if, and a lot of times we'll abbreviate that as IFF, if and only if x minus a is a factor of p of x. So p of a will equal 0 if and only if x minus a is a factor of p of x. And so what we're going to want to do, they're going to ask us to show that something is a factor of a polynomial. For example, we want to show that x plus 2 is a factor of x cubed minus 2x squared minus 5x plus 6. So what I'm going to do on this one is I'm just going to set it up to do, use synthetic division. And I'm going to go through. And if the result is, if my remainder comes out to be 0, then I know p of a is 0. And therefore, x, minus, or x plus 2 is going to be a factor. So I set this up with synthetic division. I'm going to set this part up, and since the x plus 2, I'll put a negative 2 over here. The coefficients across the top will be 1, negative 2, negative 5, and positive 6. And so, now running through a synthetic division, that first, uh, the first coefficient, that 1, just comes down. Negative 2 times 1 will be negative 2. Add it up, I get negative 4. Negative 2 times negative 4 is negative, or is positive 8, sorry. Negative 5 plus 8 plus a positive 8 is going to be 
3. And then if I take 3 times negative 2, I get negative 6. And so the result is 0. So in this case, my remainder is 0. And because my remainder is 0, I know that that is equal to P of A by the remainder theorem. And so I know that x plus 2, let me get that up there, x plus 2 is a factor of P of X, which in this case was X cubed minus 2X squared minus 5X plus 6. I also know, because we did synthetic division, that this polynomial, that the other factor that I have right now, is going to be X squared minus 4X plus 3. And I could then, once I have that, I could then factor that further to find other zeros. Now let's take a look at a, a tool that we can use to help us identify the types of zeros that we're going to have. And that tool is called the Descartes Rule of Signs. And what happens here is we have a polynomial, P of X, and you'll recognize our usual alphabet soup definition for a polynomial right here. P of X equals A sub N X to the N plus a sub n minus 1, x to the n minus 1, plus dot, 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 plus a sub 2, x squared, plus a sub 1, x plus a sub 0. And that's a polynomial function with real coefficients. And of course, a sub n does not equal 0. The number of positive real zeros is either equal to the number of variations of sine of p of x or less than that by an even integer. In other words, what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at these coefficients that I have on x. And when they change from positive to negative or negative to positive, that's going to be a variation of sign. And so when I look at that, I can count up the number of variations of signs that I have. And then I know that my polynomial is going to have, if I'm looking at just the original p of x, I know that the polynomial will have uh, that number of of positive real zeros or two less. So let's say that there was five sign changes. Well, then the number of possible real zeros would be either five, three, or one. I couldn't have two or four positive real zeros. I can only have, if I had five sign changes, it would be five, three, or one. By the same token, if I had two sign changes, I either have two positive zeros or no positive zeros. The, number, the second one we have is the number of negative zeros uh, is either um, the number of variations sine of p of negative x or less than that by an even integer. So in this case, to find the number of negative real zeros, I do have to first identify p of negative x and simplify that result. And then I look at the sine variations again. Um, so... What I'll, let's take a look at an example. In this case, our example, p of x is, is 4x to the fourth minus 8x cubed plus 7x squared plus 30x plus 50. So you'll notice that I've rewritten that here because that's going to be the one we'll identify the sign changes there. And p of negative x. p of negative x is going to be negative x raised to the fourth minus 8 times a negative x to the third. And notice the negative sign is inside the parentheses. The exponent is outside. So that means the negative sign is also going to be either is going to be raised to that power. So plus 7 times negative x squared plus 30 times negative x plus 50. And when I simplify that, I get x to the fourth plus 8x cubed plus 7x squared minus 30x plus 50. So let's, let's take a look at p of x. We'll notice here that we went from positive to negative. And so in this case, I have one sign change right here. Then I went from positive, negative to positive, so I have a second sign change there. And then it's positive, it's plus and plus the rest of the way through. So in this case, I know P of X is either going to have two positive real zeros or no positive real zeros. When I look at p of negative x, I'll notice I start out, I notice it's a positive, then positive, positive, and then it goes to negative here, and then to positive. So in this case, I have my first sign change there and a second sign change there. So in this case, I have either two negative real zeros 
or zero negative real zeros. Now we get two rules that can help us with our upper and lower bounds of our zeros. Now, if you remember, in the last video, we did the what's called the rational zero theorem, where we identified the possible rational zeros by looking at the leading coefficient and the constant term of our polynomial, and using their integer factors to form the various um, uh, possible rational zeros. And what the rational zero theorem said was that if the polynomial had any rational zeros, it came from that list of numbers. Well, what we have here is a way to go through, and as we progress through identifying zeros, we can identify if we have an upper bound or lower bound on those zeros. So we're going to let f of x be a polynomial with real coefficients and a positive leading coefficient. Suppose f of x is divided by x minus c using synthetic division. So if c is greater than 0, so if c is a positive number, and each number in the bottom row is either zero or positive. By bottom row, we're talking about the um, where we ended up with our remainder, the row that the remainder was in, the very last, the, the underneath the bar that we had. C would be an upper bound of the zeros of f of x. So if c is greater than zero, so it must be positive, and each number in the bottom row is either zero or positive, c is an upper bound of the zeros of f of x. Now, if c is less than 0 and each number in the bottom row are alternately positive or negative. Now, in this case, what happens is that 0 entries will count as whatever I want them to be. So if I need them to be a negative, I'll count them as a negative. If I need them to be a positive, I'll count them as a positive. So if they're alternately positive or negative and with the 0 entries going the way I need them to go, c is a lower bound of the zeros of f of x. What this does is this will allow us to go through and eliminate possible rational zeros from our, from our list that we have. Let's take a look at an example. What we have is, uh, in this case, we have 4x cubed minus uh, x squared plus 36x minus 9. Now, the first thing I do is ident identify my possible rational zeros by the po rational zero theorem, which in this case are factors for our, our constant term are plus or minus 1, plus or minus 3, or plus or minus 9. And the uh, factors for our leading coefficient, in this case 4, is plus or minus 1, plus or minus 2, and plus or minus 4. So our possible rational zeros, I just take this 1 and put, well, I'm going to put 1 here over all three of these, and then I'll put the plus or minus 3 over all three of these and plus or minus 9 over all three of those. So I'll get plus or minus 1, plus or minus 1 half, plus or minus 1 fourth, plus or minus 3, plus or minus 3 halves, plus or minus 3 fourths, plus or minus 9, plus or minus 9 halves, plus or minus 9 fourths. And now, by Descartes' rule of signs, when I do f of x, I'll notice here that I went from positive to a negative, so there's one sign change. Back to a positive, there's a second sign change. And then to a negative again, so we have three sign changes. So in this case, I could have three or one positive zeros. And when I go through and find f of negative x, well, what's going to happen on that, f of, in f of negative x, when I take a negative to the third power, that's going to make that negative. Negative to the second power will keep this as a negative because negative x times negative x is going to be a positive x squared, but we have the subtraction there already. So that will be negative, negative, put in a negative x there, that's going to be negative. Everything's going to end up negative. So I have no signed variations, which in this case means I have no negative zeros. So now that I've gotten, I've identified that I have all positive real zeros, I'm going to set this up with synthetic division, and I'm going to test one of the values. I'm going to test a positive 1. So we go through with synthetic division, setting it up, put a positive 1 here, and then we'll have a 4, um, negative 1, 36, and negative 9. And so running through a synthetic division, I'll bring the 
uh, 4 down. 4 times 1 is 4. So that's going to make that a 3. 1 times 3 is 3. That's going to make that a 39. And then 1 times 39 is going to be 39. And the result on there is that's going to give us a remainder of positive 30. Now you'll notice here in this case that every value here is positive. So by the upper bound theory, since 1 is positive and everything here is positive, I know that 1 is an upper bound of my zeros. So therefore, I know my that my zeros that I have, any positive zeros I have, have to be less than 1. So what that does for me now is anything that is less, that's greater than 1, I know is no longer is a possibility. So in this case, negative plus the 9 fourths, 9 halves, 9, 3 halves, 3 are no longer a possibility. I also know 1 is not a possibility because I just went through and tried it out. So now I just have to pick a value to try again. And this time what I'll try is going to be 1 fourth. So I set the 1 fourth up. Okay, and I'm going to give myself a little bit more room this time. Uh, it is 4 here, negative 1, 36, and negative 9. So, as we did before, the 4 comes down. Well, 1 fourth times 4 is going to be 1. Add that up, I get 0. 1 fourth times 0 is going to be 0, so add it up, I get 36. 1 fourth times 36 is 9, add it up, I get 0. So in this case, I know 1 fourth is a 0. But the other thing I have again is that look at these values down here. Every single one of them is positive or 0. And so by that upper bound theory, I know 1 fourth is also now an upper bound for my zeros. It's a 0, but I know that there's no zero, no positive real 0 that's bigger than one fourth. So that means that that eliminates all my other choices. I had one half or three fourths. So my only, in this case, I only have one positive real zero, and that number happens to be one fourth. This now concludes the video in terms of going through and identifying our possible zeros and, and working with that. Now we are going to have a, we're going to modify this a little bit a little bit in terms of using the calculator to help us out as well uh, next time. So when we're in class, that's what we'll be talking about there, and we'll have a procedure for finding the zeros there as well. So I hope this uh, that you are able to go and get some good information out of this, and we'll see you in class next time.